and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. This is the tree of life based on some molecular data. This is the origin of all life on Earth. And this is where we sit on this tree. Now look at all these names. This video is about taxonomy, um, naming stuff. Taxonomy at the outset doesn't seem super exciting. I mean, coming up with names, really? But it is actually really important to help us understand a lot more interesting things about evolutionary relationships among different taxa or different groups of organisms. Humans have been naming things since the very beginning, since we were first able to communicate. Uh, certainly, we named things that were important to us, like what to eat and things that we had to run away from, you know, don't eat these poisonous plants, that kind of thing. Probably stayed at about that level for countless thousands of years. And then people started coming up with systems for organizing living things on Earth. And the first person to write extensively about this was Aristotle. He said to understand anything, you have to classify it according to its parts. And he classified all animals into one of two groups, either those with blood or those he called bloodless. His work was followed by many, many others, uh, including Pliny the Elder, who wrote 160 volumes on this subject. In those days, names were really more descriptions. They were always written in Latin. Latin was established early on as the language of scholarly writing. And the honeybee was given this name. Apis pubescens, Thorace subgrisio, abdomine fusco, pedipus, aposticus glabris, ultringe, margine ciliatus, which means hairy bee, underside of the thorax gray, abdomen striped, feet positioned to the rear, smooth, with outer areas on both sides having fine hairs. Though clumsy, obviously, this naming system worked for many years because scientists didn't yet realize how many living things they were going to have to name. But there was an era of great discovery, and soon many, many organisms came under the eyes of scientists, and they realized a new naming system was absolutely essential. On to the scene comes Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish biologist who had his first foray into taxonomy in 1735 in a relatively small volume about plants. It was only 12 pages long, but he followed this up with Systema Naturae. The 10th edition, published in 1758, included 4,400 animal species and 7,700 plant species. Now, Linnaeus was not the first person to use this particular naming system that we now call binomial nomenclature, but he was the first person to use it consistently in a way that made sense. So the honeybee became Apis mellifera. Oh, what a relief. The house sparrow, Passer domesticus. The gray wolf, Canis lupus. The common ostrich, Struthio camelus. And the mouse, Nas musculus. So this binomial nomenclature, bi means two and nomial means name, comes from the fact that there is going to be a genus name and a species name. And these two words will combine to form what we call the scientific name. Now, sometimes the genus name and the species name are the same word, as in the case of the black rat. How you tell the two different names apart in that case has to do with the fact that genus names are always capitalized and species names are never capitalized. And when you write them together, the genus and species name should be either underlined or in italics. You might wonder where these names come from because some of them are downright strange. Many of them come from classical or medieval Latin, including the name that we gave ourselves in this classification system, the name Homo sapiens, which means basically wise man. Many names come from classical Greek. You may know the rhododendrons. Uh, in Greek, rhodos means rose and dendron means tree. Um, this is the national flower of Nepal. There are uh, over a thousand species of rhododendrons. Interestingly enough, most of them are shrubs. Very few of them are trees. Can't win them all. Many scientific names are named for people. 
Uh, this magnolia is named for not one, but two people. Magnolia campbellii, named for a French botanist and a lover of plants and tea. This is an extinct creature called a trilobite. And if you look at the name, you might think, hey, that looks kind of familiar. Yes, it was named in honor of Mick Jagger. What does that mean when you've got an extinct trilobite named after you? Yeah. Okay, here's a cool stock jellyfish. And from the name, you can probably guess where it's from. A lot of scientific names come from other languages other than Latin and Greek, like this one. Uh, this comes from two Greek roots, actually, meaning red wood, because it does have red wood. But the species name, coca, is a Quechua word. And coca is famous for a particular product that humans <clears throat> use. And at this point, you might be thinking, gosh, you know, is there some sort of more organized way of coming up with these names? You know, kind of like the IUPAC names uh, in chemistry. By the way, this is the structure and name of cocaine, yes, which is from the coca plant that I showed you earlier. Unfortunately, biological creatures are not as simple as naming things based on a three-dimensional structure like this. So we do not have a system like the chemists have, unfortunately, for naming uh, organisms. Biological creatures are named based on many, many taxonomic characters. And this is how we're going to determine phylogeny or relatedness between taxa or between different groups. So this is what our names are based on. Um, morphologic characters. So morphology means shape, right? And that's going to include not only the shape of the adult, but also things like embryology, the developmental forms. Uh, we name things based on physiology. We name things based on molecular characteristics. This obviously is a fairly modern one that uh, Linnaeus and his uh, peers certainly did not have. Behavioral characteristics as well as ecological characteristics and geographic characteristics. So we don't have a way to name things like chemists do because we take all of these things into consideration when coming up with names. So how do these systems work? And what are the levels of the hierarchies? Well, Linnaeus came up with a three domain system. He classified everything as being either alive, which he put in animals or plants, or not alive, which he put the kingdom of minerals. Uh, he had then six classes of animals, and I listed these because many of these groups are still in use today. So I just thought that was worth mentioning. Linnaeus got a lot of this stuff uh, right. Uh, this is where it kind of fell apart. He uh, classified insects and then vermes, and that's a term that is not in use anymore. He called these basically soft-bodied creatures uh, with tentacles. So, you know, the nudibranchs and the corals and the sea anemones would be examples of what Linnaeus called vermes. And of course, uh, we do not classify those together in one group. Um, but Linnaeus really influenced all the work to come. The idea that we would build hierarchies of similarities to determine different categories and levels of relatedness. So uh, 1866, this was a, a phylogenetic tree attempting to show, you know, who was related to whom and where all of the ancestors were. Um, we use the same ideas today. Uh, some of them are very obvious. So for example, a penguin and a sparrow should obviously be grouped together because they share a lot of characteristics. They have beaks, they have feathers, etc. Um, so we classify them together. They are more similar than either of the two groups are to herring, for example. But if you want to compare these three organisms to something like a mushroom, then you would want to put the herring in with the penguin and the sparrow because those three organisms are all animals and the mushroom is not. It is a fungus. So we group things based on levels of similarities. Today we have a three domain system. It's not the same as Linnaeus's three domain system, but these two domains are both prokaryotic. So we have the, the true bacteria, you may see those as eubacteria, and the archaea or the ancient bacteria. They are the oldest living things on the planet. And then the third domain are the eukaryotes. Those are organisms that have a nucleus 
other organelles and uh, gained multicellularity, although they're not all multicellular. This is the way that we organize uh, levels of relatedness, going from the domain to the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. There's lots of different mnemonics to help you to remember that. Um, botanists don't use the word phylum. They use the word division instead. So we're going to use as an example to show you the way this uh, organization taxonomic system works. We're going to use the dog. So the domain eukarya that the dog is in, it shares with all other living things on the planet with the exception of the bacteria. So all eukaryotic organisms are in this domain. The kingdom the dog is in is the kingdom animalia. These are mostly multicellular heterotrophic organisms. So now we've excluded things like plants, and fungi and proteists, but all animals are in this kingdom. The phylum that the dog is in is called chordata, and the chordates have a notochord, which is a supportive structure for a dorsal nerve cord. That's a nerve that runs down the back and pharyngeal gill slits, and we share this phylum along with the dog. The class is the last level that we share with the dog. We are, like dogs, mammals. We have sweat glands and we produce milk for our offspring via mammary glands. Of course, that's what the class is named for. The order that the dog is in is carnivora. These are mostly meat-eating animals. So as you can see now, uh, we are not in the same order as the dog. The family is Canidae. This family includes wolves, foxes, coyotes, and jackals. These are all what most people would consider dog-like animals. The genus is Canis, dogs, wolves, coyotes, and jackals. And the species, which now includes only dogs and wolves, Canis lupus. And because we have domesticated the dog, it gets a third level, as many organisms do, we call a subspecies, Canis lupus familiaris, the domesticated dog. So what you should notice is that as you go up, you have a decrease in the number of traits that individuals have in common with other members of their group, but you have more and more individuals in each group. So consequently, as you go down, you have less and less relatives in each category, but you have more and more in common with them. So I know this is all presented very clear and clean, and it looks like all these categories are super organized, but you know what? It's not true. Taxonomists argue constantly about the different groupings and who should be put where. And the most confusing group of all, believe it or not, is at the species level. And this has really always been the case. Even in the past, before the Age of Enlightenment, scientists could see that there were problems. Uh, Linnaeus could certainly see it. He and his peers talked about where species came from and how to properly define them. Um, he treated species as immutable. That means that they were not capable or susceptible to change. And this came from the Bible and, you know, Noah's Ark. And uh, Noah arrives on Mount Ararat and all of the animals disembark and the floodwaters recede and everybody populates the earth. And um, that was the popular thinking of the day. A French naturalist named the Comte de Buffon was really one of the first people to vocally question some of these ideas uh, about the immutability of species. He was interested in looking at fossil mammals. That was kind of a new thing. Uh, he loved especially elephants and mammoths. Mammoths are, of course, extinct. This one is in a museum in LA. And uh, he also had issues with how old the earth was. He disagreed with the biblical age of the earth. He didn't understand how organisms could cross inhospitable barriers to reach suitable environments. And in addition, he traveled a lot and he found different kinds of animals and plants in similar environments that were completely isolated from one another. And this is now called Buffon's Law. It's the first principle of biogeography. The Age of Enlightenment came, the development of paleontology, the discovery of more and more species in the fossil record, which are extinct today. 
really challenged this very static view of nature, which had persisted since Aristotle's time. And now, of course, we know that species are not fixed entities, that they change. And we can see this in lots of examples, uh, birds especially, like seagulls, these crows. Individuals of different species will mate and produce fertile offspring. And we call the products hybrids. And of course, most notably, the finches in the Galapagos Islands, which have been traced back to a common ancestor from the South American continent. And as the finches moved out into different islands, they were able to exploit and specialize on different food items, and their beaks changed over time as a result. And of course, this work was done by Charles Darwin. And his work is so pivotal, and his story is so interesting that it's going to have to be the subject of the next video. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please support by clicking those buttons, like, share, subscribe, visit on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.